Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, another week gone in our COVID-19 experience. Um, I'm back from vacation. I had a great week. And uh, for those of you who have not had an opportunity to take some time off, I highly recommend it because we're in for a marathon, not a sprint. By the way, you may not know this about me, but I've actually run three, uh, three New York City marathons. And this reminds me a lot of running one of those marathons. You know, you go over the Verrazano Bridge, it's very big and it's a two mile, very high elevation. And then you get across the bridge and you're in Brooklyn for a long period of about eight miles where it's nice and easy, easy to, easy to get your kind of a steady uh, pace. And that's kind of where we have been for the, for the past, I'd say, several months. Unfortunately, we're looking at another bridge, and we have been peaking ever since uh, Memorial Day uh, and opening up of businesses. And we've gone up from what you recall was about 200 cases a day to well over 1,000. And one of the most of, you know, ironic things of all, the week of July 4th, we averaged 1776 cases a day. So strange as it is, Somebody's talking to us about July 4th. Uh, and I thought we would be fine, but unfortunately we did plateau and things were looking good. But in the last week, uh, the week following July 4th, we've begun to see another increase in case number. And that's always the leading indicator. So we're going back up uh, each day we've been rising. If you look at the lagging indicators of hospitals admissions, they've been flat and even on a downturn and ICU which is even lagging after admissions is also flat but you can pretty much expect that very soon probably over the next three to five days we'll start seeing an increase in admissions and probably an increase in ICUs again so that that's a that's unfortunate of course we've got to get our acts together before the fall because if we talk about opening up schools that's like not only a, a bridge that's like a mountain we'll have to climb so th it's really important uh, that we start getting this under control and it turns out public health policies uh, work so, which reminds me um, I saw Tony Fauci on the TV and he was saying you know this really is a once in a century event and I started thinking, well, when was the last once in a century event? And that was the Spanish flu of, of 1918. And are there things we can learn from that? Because uh, we, we, we reference it a lot, but we don't really think back about what was going on then. So if you think about it, in 1918, uh, at the time, uh, the United States had been at war for about 11 months and was very uh, quickly trying to expand the number of soldiers. There was a big, massive increase in the number of forts that were being uh, created. And in Fort Riley, Kansas, there was a camp called Camp Funston that housed 50,000 American soldiers. And one of those sh soldiers uh, showed up in, in March with 104 degree temperature and went to the tent where they take care of people. Uh, and um, within a few hours, there were 100 soldiers. And right as that was happening, there was a deployment in April of over 50,000 soldiers and soon to be uh, 2 million soldiers that ended up in Europe. Uh, paradoxically, think about the fact that we had 3 million Europeans come through New York uh, that started our real New York, uh, the epidemic in New York. It's, it's the pandemic moving from Europe to the U.S. Well, that started the outbreak in Europe in, in, in World War I. And because uh, the governments who were involved in the war did not want to report on all the deaths other than saying they were war-related or pneumonia-related, the only country uh, that would actually report on the, the emerging pandemic was Spain. Spain was neutral in World War I. And so Spain was reporting on this new flu pandemic that was wreaking havoc throughout Europe and that is why it's called the Spanish flu. It had nothing to do with being uh, from Spain. In fact, the flu virus that caused the Spanish flu probably emerged from China. Uh, well, it was a very tough summer, lots of deaths, uh, but it's, in, in the U.S., it, it was a real problem. 
And you wonder why was it in the U.S. that was spreading when most of those soldiers were sent uh, to Europe? Well, the war economy was very important and no one wanted to quarantine the workers. No one wanted stay-at-home orders. And at the time, wearing masks was considered really bad. I mean, the, the men did not want to wear masks. They thought it was it demasculinized them. They liked to spit a lot and it inhibited them spitting. And so masks were not worn by men. And that was one of the reasons uh, that the epidemic spread so much in the United States, even though so many of the, the soldiers had been sent to Europe. It did wane, the, the flu pandemic did wane in, in the summer, but in the fall it came back uh, with a real vengeance. And uh, in, there was a one camp in Massachusetts, Camp Devons, where it had 7,000 soldiers in, uh, infected and was really just raging all across the world. The risk curve was interesting. Usually we think about young people or old people being uh, affected most, and they were affected by the Spanish flu. But in fact, it was a W-shaped curve, and 20 to 30-year-olds were dying in huge numbers. Uh, and it was really uh, uh, very, very scary for everybody. Just like we've seen refrigerated trucks in New York, well, there were mass graves for people in the United States. And the third, it was a very, very tough uh, time, but it began to wane also in the U.S. when public health measures became accepted. We started quarantining people, more and more people wore masks, and so the epidemic eventually began to wane in January of 2019. And by the summer of 2019, it was pretty much gone. That particular flu strain sort of disappeared. Uh, it did not become endemic, uh, and it was replaced in 2020 by an influenza B strain. So the whole time, it was about 18 months, but the death toll was really horrific. Um, in the United States, uh, there were over uh, uh, 400,000 uh, dead. In Great Britain, it was 200,000. Uh, in Japan, it was 400,000. In India, it was 12 to 15 million. And worldwide, it was somewhere between 60 and 100, um, 100 million people died. The symptoms were really, really bad for this disease. Uh, people would get a hemorrhagic pneumonia. They uh, often died within 24 hours of the onset. There was no treatment available. At one point, there were almost 10,000 deaths per week. And sounds familiar, but 5% of the people infected actually died. Uh, and there have been other pandemics, uh, obviously in 57 and 68, an avian flu combined with a flu virus that lives in pigs to create uh, a, another recombination event that led to infection of, of, uh, in, in man. But not all viruses have to have an intermediate species. We think that this particular one, COVID-19, probably, as I mentioned before, came uh, through an intermediate species, the, the pangolin. But some of them jump directly from the species that they live in into man. And that was what was thought to happen uh, with the Spanish flu. That it probably went directly from an avian source directly into people. And that too has happened before. So H5N1 jumped from chickens to people in 1997, and that was known as the Hong Kong flu. Uh, in the spring of 2009, uh, uh, the swine flu was another one that was in, in pigs but jumped directly to humans. Uh, and swine flu is an influenza A that affects pigs, pigs year-round but occasionally will jump uh, directly into humans. Now seasonal flu is generally a, influenza A or influenza B. There are other, there's C and D, but A and B are the main ones. A accounts for about 75% of all seasonal flu. And you'll hear about, you know, that it's called H and N because there are two major uh, antigens, the hemagglutin gene, H, and the neuraminidase gene. And the hemagglutin gene is required for the virus to enter cells, and the neuraminidase gene is required for the virus to emerge from cells as it replicates. Both of them have to uh, uh, cleave a sialic acid. Uh, most of the seasonal flu is 75% um, uh, influenza A. Now, one of the interesting uh, things is, is as, as sequencing became more readily available, uh, some archaeologists, viral archaeologists, found an Inuit uh, Eskimo who was frozen in ice who died from Spanish flu. And they were able to take uh, that person, um, thaw, out, thaw out their lungs, and I isolate uh, the Spanish flu. And that was 
uh, looked at and sequenced and what was very interesting is that it looked like the surface antigens came directly from an avian species and so that was very clear that the virus in, Sp in the Spanish flu had jumped directly from an avian source in, into man. And there were a bunch of publications between 2001 and 2005 that reconstituted the entire virus and found out that it was really much more pathogenic. It was six times more pathogenic in mice and it was thought to be because the hemagglutin gene uh, and one other gene were particularly uh, essential for optimal vir virulence. So what are the lessons we can learn from uh, the Spanish flu? First of all, it started in March of 2018 and it was over pretty much in the summer of uh, 2019 and, 2000, uh, be and the beginning of 2020. So without a vaccine, it's about an 18 month time lag. And so that's when you hear people on the news saying, how long are we gonna be living with this? And they say, oh, about 18 months to the time of the development of a vaccine, that's probably about right. It's probably gonna be between you know, 18 months and two years. The second thing we can learn from, and this is astonishing to me, public health measures work. So spatial distancing, staying home, wearing masks are the things that got the Spanish flu pandemic under control in the, in the latter part of 2019. And here we are a hundred years later arguing about whether people should be wearing masks. I mean, it is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And then the other thing that we're lucky is that our mortality is much reduced because we do have drugs and ways of managing airways that they didn't have back a hundred years ago. Uh, and the only other interesting thing is that uh, flu disappeared. Uh, it was raging across the world for 18 months, two years, and then it sort of just disappeared. Now why it disappeared is unclear. It could have been because eventually the earth <laughs> achieved, or humans achieved uh, uh, herd immunity. Uh, there were so many people affected and merely uh, two-thirds of the world was infected by this uh, virus, so that was one possibility. Uh, and, and we still don't know whether or not COVID-19 will disappear or become endemic. More likely, in my view, is that this virus will be with us for a while and will not disappear, but only when we get a vaccine can we really begin to think about eliminating that particular coronavirus. Anyway, there are lessons to be learned uh, all the time from looking back in history, and, and I think it's really interesting, the parallels between uh, COVID-19 and the Spanish flu. Now, uh, once again, we're, we, we know now that uh, this COVID-19 SARS virus isn't going away in the summer, and, and we are battling very hard. But one of the things we as a community need to do is begin to really focus on public health measures. So I say this every week, but please model behavior. When you see people not social distancing or wearing masks, please remind them to do that. Uh, I think they're gonna have a lot of discussions and debates going into the fall about school. Uh, and it's gonna be hard, hard decisions to make. Uh, but I'm really proud of the work we're doing. We are now part of the new vaccine trials. We, we plan to enroll 350 people here. We're, Baylor College of Medicine is a participating in all of the therapeutic trials. Our scientists are working hard at new drug discoveries, at diagnostics, uh, at vaccine development. And so our community, Baylor College of Medicine community, is really, really working hard uh, to serve not only our own community in Houston, but the nation. Uh, and I'm very proud of everybody at Baylor College of Medicine for what you're doing. Thank you for all your dedication. Have a great weekend. And thank you, Baylor College of Medicine, for everything you do. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. And we just got to keep it.